Welcome to another Lightblade Learning Lab. Today we're going to be tackling the subject of mirrors. Now this machine works with mirrors and if we take a look down here you'll see we have a mirror and I'm shining a light into it and it's reflecting at you. Now you will think of mirrors as something like this, something nice and shiny, which if I bend it, as you see, we get distortions. And with our laser light, we get exactly the same thing. We must have a flat mirror, otherwise we get a distorted beam. The only thing is that a shiny mirror does not mean a reflective mirror when we're talking about the infrared region. Shiny is great for visible light. It doesn't have to be shiny for infrared light. Now I demonstrated that to you in one of the earlier sessions when we took a piece of dull copper and found that it was reflecting a very large percentage of the infrared light that was fired at it. I keep using the word light because that's what it is, but in reality, as I showed you as well, it is heat, concentrated heat energy. And that's what does the work with this machine. So today we're going to look at, look at mirrors because mirrors have a very special role in this machine. So here we are at the back of the machine and we've got the laser tube itself. Now the laser tube fires a beam of light out of its end there and then it's got to somehow turn around in the opposite direction and arrive at this point where there's a third mirror which points the beam downwards towards the lens which is the bit that's really doing the work. So let's just have a quick look at how that happens. We've got one mirror here which is sitting at roughly 45 degrees so the beam comes out of here and reflects off that mirror and travels across the machine. So here is the second mirror. Once the beam has turned the corner it fires across the machine here like this onto this second mirror. And this second mirror, regardless of where it is on the machine, like this, the laser beam is hitting it and at 45 degrees it bounces off, hopefully parallel with this beam, and arrives at the cutting head. At the cutting head we have yet a third mirror which is sitting here and the laser beam comes in here and bounces off that at 45 degrees and then it gets directed downwards towards the lens which is at the bottom here where it concentrates the energy and fires it out of the nozzle. So three mirrors are involved with the transmission of this laser beam from its source to its destination. And that's why mirrors are very important. Every mirror has got to be as efficient as possible. If we assume that the mirrors, for example, are approximately, let's just say, 97% efficient. Now, that might sound quite a high efficiency, but technically what that is, that means it's 3% inefficient. And if we've got 3% loss at three mirrors, that's 10% nearly. If we start off with 60 watts, we're going to finish up with 54 watts here. And then we've got a further loss through the lens itself, which might be another 2 or 3%. So we may have as much as 12% loss through the system. Now that's quite a large loss that you don't really want to exceed. I mean, those figures that I've given you there are typical. If they get much worse than that, then I think you've got a problem with the machine itself. I'm going to be using two pieces of equipment, but what I've got here is three pieces just to show you. To be able to establish how much power the laser is generating and how much power is arriving at and from each mirror, you have to have an instrument that measures heat. Because bear in mind, this beam of energy is heat energy. And there are several things that we could use. There are many different types of power measurement meter on the market. Some of them very expensive and quite accurate. Others are cheap and okay. This is a, a cheap version 
of a power meter, which is actually quite expensive. I mean, this is something in the region of about $250, $300. Um, it's an American manufacturer and it's a very good quality. You can buy the same thing for about $100. I say the same thing, it's a Chinese copy and it's not as good, but it's adequate for doing the job. And here we've got my own version of this, which has got compromises, but it produces the same results as this within a watt or two, and it also does it a lot, lot quicker than anything like this. It's not instantaneous. It's an average, which is what we're really looking for. Uh, so that means that today, although I could be using this one, this is, relatively speaking, very slow to use, whereas this one is a lot faster. Um, I should be using this because I'm an impatient person. The third thing that we've got here is basically just a thermocouple. It's a K-type thermocouple, which, in essence, is what's buried inside here, a K-type thermocouple, for measuring temperature. Because what we're going to be doing is firing heat energy at this absorbing surface, and we're heating this block of metal up. Now, if you fire energy at this block of metal for a fixed period of time, then it will heat up by a known amount. And that's the basis upon which we're measuring the power of this machine the amount of temperature rise that we can generate in this small block of metal. Now, with this device, the answer has been scaled for us so that we get the readout directly in watts. With this system, it's a compromise. We get a reading of temperature rise, should I say, and what we have to do is we double the temperature rise for the scale that I'm using and that gives us the watts. So it's not terribly complicated. Now, as I probably have mentioned before, um, I'm gonna be firing the laser into nothing. And I personally don't like firing the laser through down to the bottom of the machine. Although my test is running at full power, what will happen is I shall be collecting the power in this device. So the power will not actually be coming through to here and down there. But if, for instance, I had to stop, then the power will finish up coming down here. And this is just really a little safety precaution. This water will fully absorb all the energy and it will do no harm at all. Um, it'll take a lot of energy to heat that water up, but eventually it will heat up. This little device here hasn't really got a name. Um, it was difficult to describe when I first invented it. It looks like a lollipop and I was going to call it a lollipop but then I decided it would make a lot more sense to call it possibly uh, an Ujima flip, um, a Watsit, a, uh, and in the end I decided to call it, as you can see that second term there, a doohickey. It's a term that the Americans use for something that really doesn't have a description and so this has affectionately become known as a doohickey and I've got a program on here which has been designed to make a, a burn of 20.5 seconds, a very specific length of time. And so we'll just load that program in. And here's what the program looks like. It has a blue section up there, which runs from the center to the outside at one millimeter per second and that's 10 millimeters long so for 10 seconds it runs at one percent power now one percent power will not turn the laser on so effectively I have 10 seconds to push the button and do anything I like before the test actually starts and then the test starts and it follows this spiral pattern so that the beam does not stand still in any particular spot on here at a given point in time. That's if I'm going to be leaving it sitting still, but most of the time I should be moving it around manually in front of the beam, as you'll see. And that runs for 14, it runs at 14 millimeters a second. That pattern lasts for 20.5 seconds. Now, <clears throat> one important feature that you must have when you're using one of these power meters 
is a bucket of water. Not because there's a fire risk, but because you need a bucket of water which is basically room temperature. This bucket of water has been sitting in here for several weeks and it's got the same basic room temperature as this workshop. And it's important that every time you run a test you start from the same temperature, give or take a degree or so. So I'm going to start this off by waggling it around in there and finding out what temperature it's stabilised at. It looks to be about nine and a half degrees. Well, whether it's nine and a half degrees, 10 and a half or 11 degrees is not too critical, but it mustn't be 15 or 20. So within a degree or so is what we're looking for. And now we'll make sure that we dry the probe off. And I always start with the meter off. We'll go round to the front of the machine and we'll start the program off. You can hear the machine is running. The power is not running because the tube's not lit. And now I'm going to stand here. I'm going to put the power on and I'm going to put 9.4. And now I'm going to put this in front of here. And as you can see, I'm moving it around so that I collect the power evenly over the surface. Yes, done. 37.2. So that's the maximum value. And our starting temperature was 9.4. We're running the machine at 67% power, which is supposedly should be giving us 60 watts. So let's have a quick look to see what, how the maths works out. 37.2, 37.2, minus 9.4 equals 27.8 times 2 equals 55.6. Well, that's a bit down on expectations. So the tube is not delivering now what it was when I tested it originally. So we'll repeat the test. The temperature rise is 37.4 minus 9.7, which is start point, equals 27.7 times 2 equals 55.4. So we've got a reasonably consistent result coming in there. So coming out of the tube, we've got 55 point-ish. Now, you'll remember that we made this little device. This is quite a handy little device because what it does, it shows me approximately, once it's bounced off this mirror at 45 degrees, it's gonna come out here. So this gives me a nice idea where the laser beam, where the laser beam's coming out. So we we'll run the same test again, but this time we'll do it after the mirror. So we're starting off at 10 degrees, and we finish up at 35.3. Well, it doesn't take a mathematical genius to work out the difference as being 25.3. And we double it up and that's 50.6. So we've basically lost 5 watts across that mirror. 5 watts out of 55, that's 10% across that one mirror. Give or take points here and there. Now that is horrendous. Why? Is it the quality of the mirror? Shouldn't be because these are molybdenum and mirrors. And molybdenum and mirrors typically are about 97 or 98 percent efficient. This one appears to be 90 percent efficient. Okay, let's try something, should we? I think Glazer were very kind and provided me with a case full of pieces which basically is a lens and mirror cleaning kit. So let's take a look inside. We've got two chemicals in here. One of them is 
isopropyl alcohol and the other one is acetone. Well isopropyl alcohol is it's, it's quite a gentle cleaning agent um, and it dries off very quickly but acetone is a lot more aggressive but a great material if you want to do a fairly substantial clean on the mirrors. Now the mirrors are not as sensitive as the um, as the lens and so because these are molybdenum which is a very hard metal we can be when I say aggressive <laughs> I don't mean we can go at it with a hammer but acetone is not likely to have any serious effect on the surface finish so I'm going to take a cotton wool bud and we're going to have a go with the acetone at cleaning the surface of the mirror itself now all I'm going to do is to rub it with the cotton wool bud and give it a good clean. I mean the surface, to be honest, the surface is completely shiny. There is, and there is, if we look carefully, we might see just a small amount of brown staining on there. Just a small hint. Nothing serious. So we've taken a little bit of something off the surface. Let me do it again with the other end of the cotton wool bud and see whether we can get any more off. Now as you can see, I'm not being particularly gentle with this. I'm being quite, giving it a quite good old scrub. And again, we are getting a little bit of discoloration on the bud. So it's still not completely clean. Let's use the other side of the bud and see what else we get. Let's try another completely clean bud. Now we don't have any coloration on there at all. So whatever was on there is not anymore. Now to make sure we get consistent results, we're going to take another set of readings directly out of the uh, out of the laser, and then we'll take another set directly out of the mirror. Sorry, my results are a little bit on the crude side, but before we started the clean, we had 55.5 watts going into the mirror and 50.6 coming out which was a loss of 4.9 watts, an efficiency of 91.2% for that mirror. Um, can I be crude and say, crap, <laughs> that is terrible. But, you saw how much we took off, not very much. The mirror was very, very shiny before we started, and now it's still very, very shiny. But look at the difference that the clean has made. We took two results just to be sure. One of them was 98.5% efficiency and the other is 98.9% efficiency. So whatever we want to look at, we're now within 2%, which is our target. We want to be 98% plus, ideally. If we get 97, we should be happy. 98 is approximately the best we can expect from the mirror itself. So it's doing a little bit better than the best that it could do. But of course, we haven't got an exact measurement system here. It may well be a little bit out. But the point is, it's in the right ballpark. This is not in the right ballpark, and those are. And we've seen the only difference we've had is we've cleaned the mirror. To be honest, I didn't know what I was expecting to find. I'm here demonstrating and talking about mirrors. I don't know what these mirrors are like. So this is the first time I've seen it for myself. And here's how we'd go about trying to rectify the problem to start with. So we've worked on mirror number one and we've seen we've got a significant improvement. Now we ought to take a look at mirror number two. Now I'm just going to run the test in dry mode at the moment, i.e. without the doohickey in the way, and I want to see what the current is that's being drawn by the meter. And it is 22.2 milliamps so the current drawn is as expected but the power out is not quite what I've expected so let's see what we've got coming into mirror number two 10.9 to be honest we're less interested in the actual power 
that's going in here. We're not testing the laser tube at the moment. What we're really interested in is trying to work out what the power loss is on each mirror. Okay, let's get our acetone out and do the same thing again. And as you can see, I'm showing you this time just how much of a scrub I'm giving it. I'm pretty serious about it. This is not... Uh, just a little bit of coloration on the, on the cotton wool bud, but not a lot. As you can see, I've been pretty aggressive. And again, we'll just remove any residue with a, a lens tissue. We'll go through the same procedure, check the input and then the output. And there we go, mirror number two is now playing ball. It was uh, losing 4.5% before we started, now it's losing 1.5%. So that's good. Now to check out mirror number three, which is up here, what we've got to do is to take the take the lens off. So we'll drop the lens away and we'll fix that up somewhere where it's not going to get damaged. It's going to go backwards and forwards there, round and round, but it'll happily sit there I think without any problem. Yep. And we're starting off with 11.3. Eleven point zero. Okay, now cleaning this mirror is more difficult because we've got slightly limited access to it. We've got to go in through this tube at the front here. So it's going to be a lot more difficult to scrub this one. As I said, I'm being quite aggressive with these mirrors. I certainly wouldn't want to do this on a lens but I just happen to know that these are molybdenum mirrors and they will take to be honest quite a lot of batting around so let's just use our lens tissue it's quite important that you do use the lens tissue to finish with because the alcohol or the um, either of these chemicals will leave a residue on the surface of the mirror and any residue that's there could change the uh, could change the surface appearance as far as the uh, infrared is concerned and you don't want anything which is going to change the crystal structure that reflects the light so we're going to start off with about 11.6 and now I have a problem because this mirror has not performed the same as the others we had 94, nearly 95% before we started and after we've cleaned it we've dropped to 90% so we've actually made it worse. How come? Well I don't know at the moment because bear in mind I'm learning just like you are how this system works. Now I know how to clean mirrors and I know how to check mirrors um, so this is an interesting problem so there's another issue here that's not necessarily a mirror issue. Hmm it's an interesting question. The thing is when I'm doing my mirror test I'm using 67% power so I'm going to set my power on the pulse button to 67%. Now I think what I'm going to do I'm going to dip that tug in water. Because I don't want that target to catch fire at 67% but I do want to see the burn marks, so I'm going to gently pulse it.
Now I'm going to take the middle away because I don't want the ash there because the ash will the ash will start to set fire to it. Now I know I might be smoking the mirror, but we can clean the mirror. Now this beam is supposed to be, so I'm told, a three millimeter beam. Now how can a three millimeter beam produce a nine millimeter hole? And I'm guessing that's nine millimeters. So let me just have a look, see what size it is. Bear in mind if it's scorched, some sort of energy has caused it to scorch and that's 8.3 that way and the burn doesn't go downwards and that direction there is 10.5. My point is I think that probably what's happening here we could well be clipping the edge of the mirror because this beam looks as though it is low and we haven't got very much mirror space to play with. Now that will become obvious when I start telling you about beams uh, next time. But my suspicion is that if I could raise that beam very slightly I would get more efficiency. What I'm going to do is just tip the beam up very slightly. Let's just give it a quick pulse. You can see it's low. Now if anything it's slightly high and there we go, spot on the centre. And here we've got a summary of the results and it's best not to look necessarily at the efficiencies, although we did raise the efficiency of mirror one from 91.2 to 98.9 and mirror two we raised that from 95.7 to 98.5 and mirror three well, that was 94.7 to start with, and we didn't actually raise it at all. We made it worse until we realigned the mirror, and then we took it up to 97.1, which is still not perfect. It's not as good as it should be, but 3% loss, 2.9% loss, is within the realms of acceptability. I would prefer it to be 2% or below. Um, but this really sums up what the situation is and why it's important that you keep your mirrors in good condition. If we started off with 60 watts then if we left it as it was we would have dropped to 54.7 at mirror 1, 52.3 at mirror 2 and 49.6 at mirror 3. So we've lost nearly 11 watts across three mirrors. 11 watts out of 60 is a big chunk. Now, now that we've fixed the mirrors, with a 60 watt output, we would have been 59.3 at mirror one, 58.4 at mirror two, and 56.8 at mirror three. So now we've only lost 3.2 watts. Now 3.2 watts is very good because that's about 5%. Well, you can see what it says on my cup. I'm enjoying life. Um, what we're doing here, uh, they're not really lessons because I have got no idea where each one of these sessions is going. I choose a subject, and we decided it was going to be uh, mirrors today, um, and we've looked at the mirrors on this machine. It's the first time I've looked at the mirrors on this machine and investigated them, so I've got really no idea what we were going to find. Um, but, but that's the way that I like working. And uh, I enjoy it. Uh, problems? Bring them on. Um, we've seen a few problems today, and I've had a few problems in the last week or so. Um, I was doing some Christmas cards. Oh, and this is the run-up to Christmas, and um, these mince pies are really delicious. Now, because it's not polite to speak with your mouth full, um, I've cut out the bit where I was enjoying a mince pie. 
Oh. I have got another one here, but uh, I'm gonna save that for a few minutes time. With these sessions, I shall never know where quite they're going to lead to. Today, we very conveniently led into the next session about beam alignment. A few days ago, as I said, this is the run up to Christmas here, I was using this machine to cut Christmas cards. And I discovered a small problem with this particular machine that wouldn't normally be spotted by most people. The beam itself, the cross beam, there's a relative squareness problem between the X and the Y axis. It was only small, but with my Christmas cards, when I did a fold into two, there was just the merest amount of misalignment between the two edges, which told me that there was an out of squareness problem. Now, being the sort of person that I am, it was an excuse to rip the machine apart. I could have left it, but I decided not to. Um, have I invalidated the warranty? Who cares? I didn't have a warranty on that one. <laughs> Basically, I've fixed the problem and it now is perfect. But in doing so, I screwed up the beam alignment. And that took me into a whole new area. My competence at beam alignment is moderately good on the little Chinese machine that I've got over there. This machine is a completely different arrangement, the way the mirrors are set up, the way the mirrors adjust, and it caused me quite a few issues. So I felt that it was a good time to look at beam alignment as the next subject, following on from mirrors. And today, the very last thing that we saw at mirror three, I had to tweak the alignment to get the efficiency out of that last mirror. And that just demonstrates how critical it is that your beam is correctly aligned. The last session told you how important it was to look after your lens and understand what your lens does. This session hopefully has shown you how important it is to look after your mirrors and understand why they need to be cleaned regularly. And then the other question is, do you need to clean them regularly? What you really need to do is be in a position to monitor them with some sort of power measuring equipment. So I think most people should have some sort of power measuring equipment. Now this is something I designed myself and it's, it's a DIY thing which is the bits of the kit are available um, if you need them then you can talk to Think Laser about it and they will they will explain the situation to you. They have got their own meters that they could probably sell you. Um, the choice will be yours. But you will see me using this quite a lot in the future. And it's one of the most useful tools in my armory. Now, because I'm doing this work with this piece of equipment, I glossed over it today. But as a quick aside, I have noticed that the laser tube itself is a bit inconsistent in its performance. So I'm going to have to have a quick word with Think Laser about that because it isn't meeting my expectations for an EFR tube. But to be honest, I'm using this machine a lot. I'm not using that machine as much as I thought I would. Um, I'm rather in love with this machine. It's nice and simple to use. It's quick, it's clean, it's quiet. Um, yeah, um, I'm definitely falling in love with it. Um, but, you know, I should keep finding excuses to pull it to pieces. Um, just because it's me. So don't get upset because you see me pulling the machine to pieces. Um, I'm just a natural destroyer. Um, I like to rebuild it and make it better, but pulling it apart and looking at how it works, I don't feel comfortable about a piece of kit until I've done just that and I understand how every part of it works. So you'll probably come along with me during that session and you'll find out more about your machine through these sessions than you probably ever will from your engineer or from any tutorials that you might look at on the old interweb. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, as I said, you might not be watching this till the new year, but it's coming up to Christmas, so I'm going to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a very pleasant new year. Cheers. <laughs>